For the past 200 years, many people have tried to create devices or craft experiences with the allure of bringing others into another reality. Before virtual reality became technically possible in the 1960s thanks to advancements in computer technology, artists and inventors were hard at work to create artificial realities with the tools at their disposal. So attempts at creating an artificial reality started far before the explosion of VR tech in the 2010s. I'm going to categorize the broad history of virtual reality into four distinct eras. The first being from 1800 to 1940, the second from 1940 to 1985, the third from 1985 to 2010, and the last being from 2010 until now. I'm using these eras as a way to classify and organize the technical advancements for achieving some sort of artificial reality, though keep in mind some exceptions exist, um, but this classification is what worked best for me and for this video. But enough chit chat, let's dive into the first era. In fact, if you really want to view the earliest attempts at artificial reality, all you have to do is go to your local art museum and look for the biggest painting that you can find. Panoramic paintings became increasingly popular in the 19th century and were intentionally designed to be so large and lifelike as to confuse the spectator between what was real and what was image. These panoramics might try to capture an epic battle, an important event in history, or maybe just a beautiful landscape. In any case, their mission was the same. Panoramics tried to create an artificial reality that existed with the purpose of transporting the viewer to a separate point in space and time. But the problem with trying to rope someone into a different world with a painting is that there can be a lot of other distractions. It's hard to feel roped into a setting when there's tons of people between you and the painting in that visual space. But fret not, as an invention from 1832 offered a way to close that space. In the 19th century, devices called stereoscopes were first developed by scientist and inventor Sir Charles Wheatstone with the help of optician Robert Murray. This unique invention ended up being a big hit because once a viewer put their face in the headset, they would be able to fully immerse themselves in whatever image was put into the device, so long as it was formatted for the stereoscope. Stereoscopes became incredibly popular and there was huge demand for more images that could be viewed in them, so stereographers were sent around the world to capture new images for the device. With stereoscopes, it was much easier to create an artificial reality for the user. The user wanted to be transported to Paris or Cairo or Hong Kong. All they had to do was slip the stereoscopic images into the device and be taken to another land. For the next 100 years, the design was refined and made to be more economical and, more importantly, fun. The whole contraction was put into a box and started to assume a more familiar shape. And then, in 1939 at the New York World's Fair, the legendary Viewmaster stereoscope was debuted. Soon after, viewers and reels were sold to picnic settings such as Carlsbad Caverns in New Mexico and the Grand Canyon in Arizona. The Viewmaster was first marketed as a sort of virtual tourism device for adults, where users could buy reels with photos of destinations around the world. But eventually, the Viewmaster was marketed to kids and reels with more fun subjects were being sold. But by the 1950s, recent advances in technology allowed for more sophisticated inventions that created more immersive worlds. Whereas the stereoscopes of the past century were simple devices, advances in film and computers allow for the creation of much more complex settings. In the mid-1950s, a cinematographer by the name of Martin Heilig developed a theater cabinet called the Sensorama that used sight, sound, smell, and touch to immerse the user in one of six short films that Martin shot for it. By the late 1960s, headsets were able to be hooked up to computers rather than just photographs and film. These headsets could display imagery that, while not that impressive now, were revolutionary for the time. By using computers to generate virtual environments, it wasn't just an artificial reality that was being created, but a virtual one. The first virtual reality head-mounted display, or HMD for short, that was connected to a computer was called the Sword of Damocles by computer scientist Ivan Sutherland and his students at Harvard University. The entire machine was large, intimidating, uncomfortable to wear, and the user had to be strapped into the device. By the 1970s, there was one crucial aspect of the technology that had yet to be investigated. 
It wasn't until 1975 with Myron Kruger's Video Place that the concept of togetherness and connecting with another person on the other side of the world was explored. At the University of Connecticut, Myron's Video Place was an artificial reality lab that used projectors and video cameras to display the silhouettes of participants onto a projector screen. What was unique about the Video Place was that participants did not need to be in the same room. They could be anywhere on the planet. The user's movements were recorded by camera and then processed by computer which would translate their interactions with the system's pre-programmed virtual objects. It was a revolutionary experience, unencumbered by wires or other heavy computer gear. Most importantly, users, for the first time, had a sense of presence while interacting with their counterparts in a virtual environment. After a few more critical advancements in VR technology, including the first portable HMD, controllers that could be used to interact with the virtual environment, and the exponential evolution of computers and graphics, companies were starting to invest in the commercial viability of virtual reality, often with little success. The first company to make a serious effort to sell virtual reality HMDs and gloves to the public was VPL Research, who was founded in 1985. The company's signature products were the Dita Glove, the iPhone, spelled EYE phone, not to be confused with an Apple iPhone, and the Data Suit. Not only was VPL the first company to sell virtual reality gear, they were also the first company to actually use the term virtual reality for their products. However, this endeavor to make a serious effort to sell virtual reality devices wasn't entirely successful, as the company filed for bankruptcy just five years later. What is most important is that VPL made a noticeable impact on the public perception of virtual reality. The Data Glove, arguably the coolest part of the whole VR getup, inspired the legendary Power Glove, manufactured by Mattel for the NES in 1989 which sold nearly 1 million units worldwide. Also, the Data Suit made an appearance in the 1992 sci-fi horror film The Lawnmower Man, which depicts a man who was unethically experimented on but develops superhuman powers and desires to become a being of pure energy inside of computer systems around the world. Although VPL failed to sell virtual reality devices, there was still commercial interest in the technology. Capitalizing on this, both Sega and Nintendo tried their hands at developing their own VR devices with mixed success. Sega began working on a VR headset for the Sega Genesis console in the early 90s, but had to cancel the project late in development, supposedly due to reports of testers developing severe headaches and motion sickness while in the system. However, the following year, Sega released another virtual reality device, called the VR1, as an amusement park attraction at the Joypolis theme park in Yokohama, Japan. The VR1 received incredibly popular reviews and was considered an unparalleled experience in until modern VR headsets were developed in 2010. Similarly, Nintendo attempted to break into the VR market with his Virtual Boy system released in 1995. Commercially, the Virtual Boy failed miserably due to a litany of concerns, mostly due to its high price, unimpressive display, and health risks. It is one of Nintendo's lowest selling standalone consoles ever at only around 1 million units sold. For the next 15 years, there wasn't much development for personal virtual reality devices following the commercial failures of the 80s and 90s. But all that changed in 2012 when, at 19 years old, Palmer Lucky founded Oculus VR. Palmer founded Oculus VR to facilitate the launch of his Kickstarter campaign for the sixth generation of his VR headset prototypes, called the Oculus Rift. While Palmer had a massive following due to sharing his progress to various online communities, things really took off when Palmer's Kickstarter campaign received endorsements from gaming giants such as John Carmack of id Software and Gabe Newell of Valve. The campaign raised $2.4 million, far exceeding the initial goal of only $250,000. A couple Several years later in 2014, Facebook, seeing the huge potential in Oculus, acquired the company for $2 billion. And then, in 2016, the floodgates opened. Facebook releases the Oculus Rift, 
The electronics company HTC, in collaboration with Valve, releases the Vive, and Sony releases PlayStation VR. From here, standalone VR systems continue to take off, with Facebook releasing more iterations of the Oculus that do not require a wired computer connection or bulky tracking sensors. Valve, cutting its relationship with HTC, releases its premium, top-of-the-line $1,000 Valve Index, and HTC releases its Vive Cosmos series. The market is finally flush with high-end virtual reality devices. From epic landscape portraits to highly sophisticated headsets, the mission of immersing the user into an artificial world has advanced considerably these past 200 years. Although recent developments for creating virtual worlds, including Facebook's metaverse, seem pretty silly, they make the statement that people foresee virtual reality becoming more ubiquitous with our everyday lives. But who knows what the future of virtual reality holds? For now, let's just appreciate a comfortable headset and some amazing games. Thanks for tuning in to this week's video. If you liked it, I would appreciate a thumbs up, and if you want to keep up with more Video Game Explain, you can click the subscribe button too. But thanks so much again for watching, and I will talk to you all next time.